Hi, I'm Andrew Yates. I'm the CEO and founder of Promoted.ai. I like my coffee black with one or two ice cubes so it doesn't scald me. Abby, welcome back. Hi. It's awesome to have you as a co-host. I really like this. I love talking to you. Today's interview is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, so we were talking to Andrew Yates, as you all just heard, and he is, oh, I love the experience that he has. I love how he saw a need for this ads platform and he went out and he created it himself. He said in the interview, which I thought was fascinating, at Pinterest, there was nothing like what he wanted when he went out looking at the market to see for the Pinterest ads platform. And so he said, why not just create it myself? And he's really trying to go and serve these very, very advanced tech companies and their ads marketplace and all of that good stuff. So we chatted with him about the Spotify's and the Facebook's and the Pinterest's of the world and the ads platform that they have. And I think, let me just explain it real quick in layman's terms and see if you understood it the same way. I think it's basically like when you use Facebook or uh, Twitter or TikTok, for example, and you want to put ads on Facebook, you have the option to go to the Facebook ads platform. And there is where you say what kind of creative you want. You say how much you're willing to spend and all of that good stuff. And one of the really fascinating things about their product, at least for me, is their focus on revenue. And which is not something I see. And especially when yeah. it comes to ads, it's such an important factor. Hey, yes, I'm putting out ads, but how much revenue are we actually making out of this product or out of this particular ad? Yeah, and that he he brought up so many good points with real time and how you need to be on top of it because you can go from profitable to unprofitable real quick with ads and that is you're playing with money and sometimes you're playing with a lot of it. So you better make sure that it's correct. Yeah, I, I love this the tiny bit he talked about the streaming deal as well and the challenges that they are in a tech with streaming versus mm. bash tech as well. Yeah, but that was one great. of the most interesting things for me in this entire conversation was he has this very clear thought process about how he sees things. So, for example, there was this one discussion where we asked, What really inspired you to go in at? And he said, Well, all these big companies are essentially ad businesses. And when I personally look at Google, especially like a SaaS business, but I never thought, Oh my God. But ads are the only thing that are actually making money for that business. Yeah. So, you know, they might have hundreds of products, but at the end of the day, this is an ad business. So important. So important. So let's get into it with Andrew Yates. And for anyone that wants to check out his company, it is, again, it's called promoted.ai. You can find it online, on the internet, and for anybody else that is out there and you're listening, you find value in this, it would mean the world to us if you give us a like or a follow or you maybe leave a review. That would be even more incredible. We would be so thankful because that triggers the algorithm and lets the world know that this is worth listening to. All right, let's jump into it. Dude, I'm super excited to talk to you. I really want to hear all about the this ad platform, what you've been doing. I don't know if you know this, but we have done some system design like deep dives on ad platforms, specifically the Uber ads platform. And we made like an animated video out of this. So ad platforms is something that is, is close to my heart. We haven't done anything with the Facebook or Pinterest uh, ad platforms, which I think you were closer to than the Uber one. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we get into any of that, we should probably just start with your background. I know that you went to college for one thing, and then you came out, you went to the valley, and your life spun around. Can you give us a little bit of the download on on what happened there? Yeah. Well, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Andrew Yates. I'm CEO of Promoted. And yes, I left school and came to San Francisco and thought, hey, ad tech is it's what makes the valley run. Let's learn ad tech. 
but it's not so easy to get into ad tech there at that time. That was like 2012 or 13 or so. A lot of people are starting ad tech startups, but they weren't successful in comparison to Facebook or Google. So I went to go work at Facebook ads, learned the industry, joined Pinterest, learn industry there as well, and then started promoted uh, all the way into winter 21. Uh, I'll ask you something here. Um, so you got interested in ad tech. What was the one very specific thing? Was it a particular conversation with somebody, some sort of article that sort of said, hey, let's get interested in ad tech. This is an up and coming space. Oh, well, it was already the space. I think people try not to look directly at the sun and want to pretend other industries compare, but Google is an ads business. Facebook is an ads business. Amazon has a huge ads business. Microsoft has a huge ads business. Apple has a huge ads business. Those are the biggest, most important technology companies. Their businesses are somehow commercial media and it touches on every other business. It's, it's challenging to think about in a couple of ways. One is because there doesn't seem to be much opportunity for promising startups in this space. And that was actually one of the things that inspired us to get started where it seemed like there had been such a long number of years where people were not ambitious in ad tech because you could go to Facebook or Google and they were so dominant for so long that there was an opening. And in fact, I got that feedback at Pinterest when, when I was having lunch with someone from business development, she says, Hey, there are no good tech. There's no good startups in ad tech. And, and she's right. I mean, according to Pinterest standards, there, there'd be nothing there that Pinterest would have any interest in regarding using their product or, or any kind of acquisition or the engineers working on it wouldn't have been any of any interest to a company like Pinterest. And in fact, I think Uber would have found the same thing. Um, I know that they outsourced their ads for some time. Uh, this is something that we explicitly go after. And it's not so much on the technology side. It's more of like honestly building your ad system and not goofing around with the measurement and attribution model to pull forward revenues to try and make your numbers every quarter and keep repeating that process over and over. There's a technology to it as well, but there's also like an organizational practice about something about ads makes it, and this is getting back to a little bit to the, the motivation and, and I think the opportunity. There's a tremendous amount of technology and thinking behind ads. It's the business that is running the top technology companies. And when it comes to paying the bills, that's the business that people are working on in-house. There's a phrase about top minds of a generation have been wasted on getting people to click on ads. People really hate to talk about ads. They really don't want to identify as, oh, we're ad tech people. There's a famous quote from Twitter about ads are like oxygen. You have to have them, but it's not something you, you really celebrate or want to work on. We come at, from, come at it from the opposite side, and especially this idea of an honest ad system, which is own it. Like you're here to make profits for everybody and design the system in such a way that you make it as fair as possible. And there's a lot of technological implications to how you would build such a system, and we'll get into that, especially from the ML ops side. But a lot of it comes down to measurement and philosophy in the organization as opposed to technology. The, the idea of pr predicting clicks is not new. People have done that before. But the idea of having your entire organization maximize for one goal versus always having this extra magical lever to pull in a little bit extra revenue at the end of the quarter, or hey, the core business isn't working. Let's just goof around with a couple of things and try to get those budgets in, and later it'll get fixed. To not do that and do it the right way is is incredibly powerful. So that's what we're solving here at Promoted is is an honest ad system that is so great that we can run all commercial media, not just ads. So maybe you can take us through the evolution of what has happened with ad tech in this amount of time, because I imagine 10 years ago, that was 
where people were tinkering with machine learning and they were trying to get some machine learning into ad tech. And now it's basically a, it's like table stakes. Yes. There was an interesting book called Chaos Monkeys that, that Antonio, um, which is his last name is escaping me at the moment, but it starts with an M, he, I think. Wrote, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he wrote an interesting book about ads at Facebook back in like 2010 or so. And, and he had this philosophy around Facebook ads would totally fail because they didn't participate in this real time bidding ecosystem, this open ecosystem. And instead they built this closed ecosystem and you would have to send all of your data to Facebook and only Facebook would be able to, to use its own data. Most people expected Facebook to not be a trillion dollar company. It, they had a lot of struggles. Um, but uh, I worked on the team that came later. So I worked on the team that worked on the machine learning application of all of that data. And it turned out that back around 2010 or so, both Facebook and Google in particular were able to come up with techniques to start monetizing the data that they had directly through machine learning and click and conversion prediction models. And it worked really, really well. It exceeded everyone's expectations. One of the first examples of it was the mobile app install ads on, on Facebook, which was just like this breakout market. And then this idea of monetizing mobile ads was just, it, before it was all banner ads on web and, and mobile ads just didn't work at all. So there was this interesting dynamic where it, it's not like just only maximizing, like if you have a recommendation system, making it a little bit better gets you a little bit better. But for ads, there's this threshold of profitability where if it's unprofitable, you should do it never. But as soon as it crosses over into an enough efficiency where it starts to become unit profitable, you should buy infinite of, of these. And that's what was starting to happen in, in the 2010 or so is using machine learning, successful applications of machine learning, ads were becoming efficient enough that this ecosystem was built up to build up Facebook, for example, was, was, was the biggest success story of this. Going a little bit away from, let's say, Facebook and thinking a little bit more towards the bigger marketplaces, what are the big challenges they're facing today, especially given the fact that you use third-party cookies to sort of track data and now there are bare laws again for user privacy, like GDPR in Europe, and there's a California Protection Act, I believe, in California. Well, first of all, if it's on your own website, those are not relevant to you. So if you're trying to aggregate data across many different sites, then it's a challenge. If you're Google, somehow they have come up with, like you just, Google has been affected for, for sure. Uh, certainly Facebook has been affected more. However, they have come up with strategies to continue figuring out what you're doing around the web. Everyone, because that's their core expertise and they're a trillion dollar company. There are other companies that do this less successfully. So if you are, a let's say unicorn marketplace you are not going to be able to come up with the entire playbook of google to figure out how to track people around the web and on different mobile app devices and so you're going to have to have a different playbook but bringing this back down to earth regarding ads on marketplaces it shouldn't be that relevant because the transactions are happening on your own marketplace why do you need to go and track people around the web you can track them on your own app. That has never changed. That's the same. You know what they're doing on your own app. So as far as like when it comes to your time at Facebook and Pinterest, one thing that I'm very curious about is building out these platforms. You spoke a little bit about the vision there, which is a whole nother beast that I want to get into in a minute, but maybe just like for people who have never worked at either company, can you paint the picture mm -hmm. of what it looks like to work on a data team in each one of these companies? Like what's the structure of the team? How does the, how do the goals, what you're working with OKRs, I imagine, but what are the mm -hmm. things that you're looking at? Like 
in the detail, in as much detail as possible, uh, to be able to just like show us what are the differences there? Yeah. There's not a single data team at these bigger companies. One, one thing that I think is there, there, there are two aspects of how I think it can be done better versus how it's done in practice. One is batch versus streaming. And the second is unified across your whole app versus ads having their own system. I'll start with the latter. It's a little easier. Most companies, when they do ads, it, there's, a, there's a very clear cultural break when they do ads. Our core business is, is peaked out. We need to make more profits. And then they will go build a team, both in social media and in marketplaces, and maybe even food delivery apps, rideshare apps. They will go build an entirely separate team to do everything end to end. They will do their own measurement. They will do their own inventing. They will do their own machine learning. They will do their own delivery system. And then there's some sort of orchestrating system that combines ad results with organic results at the end. Someone says, well, if only you got us this cost per click or this positive return on ad investment, we give you this huge budget, but we're, you're only spending this small budget. So, well, we have all of these ad impressions, but when we originally started, our ad uh, attribution model says that they're, they're not generating value. But we look at all these ad impressions we're serving. The data side of it is it's, it's predicting clicks and conversions and tracking impressions and insertions and things. These are the sort of things that you would expect to be table stakes for everything on your app. Why is it so substantially different? for clicks and conversions and for impressions. Why is it for an ad, it's a totally different thing than when it's your ordinary organic product, like ordinary things that are showing up, let's say Uber Eats or, or your marketplace or Facebook newsfeed or Pinterest or for whatever. Nevertheless, these are constructed as almost two, they are usually constructed as entirely two separate systems. When, if you think of it as one thing, you can get the benefits of both. Um, on the ad side, the ad side has a strict definition of visibility around, an impression has a uniform definition that you're not supposed to mess around with, uh, an IAB impression. Like you have to have seen it for a certain amount of time with a certain number of pixels. And then for a click, you're supposed to define to your advertisers, this is, this is what a click means, and then stick to that definition and not there's another sort of measurement interesting thing. Not, not change the definition of clicks to make them more common so that you can build more to your advertisers. You can benefit tremendously from this sort of rigor of, of measurement definitions because the, the better measurement allows you to train more better, more accurate models. Um, on the other side of it, the ads, well, you have one marketplace. Could you use the data of all of what people are doing across your entire app to better optimize your ads? Well, yes, you could, but you have to cooperate with your search and discovery team to be able to have the data pipeline in place and, and, and or, or things like, and I've, I think you've probably experienced this before, you see an ad and right, like right below it is the organic listing. And you're thinking, wow, like, could these two systems talk to each other? And they could, right? Or that's like from a pricing aspect. It's like, would you bill, would you pay the same amount to win first? if you were already going to win first, if you didn't pay for an ad? And the answer is almost always no, you'd pay less or nothing at all. Um, you can set these sort of systems up from the measurement side, but you need the unification between the ad side and, and the organic side. So that's the, the, the part around, there's a lot to be learned by combining together what's best in ad tech with what's best in the organic overall product into an overall measurement solution. There's also this idea of batch versus streaming. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Most systems start mm. with batch, especially if they were built five years ago, because streaming is really hard. It's, it's, just, it's just a whole separate other discipline. For batch, you can throw everything into Hive and you can have a different, you can have data scientists frequently write SQL queries and generate what, or, or models in a notebook and every day it's generated. Which works pretty well, to be clear. And, and, and when I worked at Facebook, by the way, we were doing that. That was back in you know, 2013 or 14 or something like that. Like daily batch is okay. It'll get, it'll get some of the job done. 
the biggest difference in ads is you're spending other people's money in real time. And so a model delay of like two or three days, what's been happening for those two or three days? Like, have you been spending someone's money in some ridiculous way that they would like to change very quickly? Uh, when I said that Facebook was doing daily batch training, they were, but they also had these other real time systems to make sure that if something went awry, that you could respond to it immediately. These were uh, calibration models and these were also pacer models regarding, hey, I have a, a, a budget. I need to try and pace this evenly throughout throughout the day. So in ads use case, the streaming case becomes much more important because you can't have your model be wrong in an individual case for too long or else you start spending someone else's money and so the real-time streaming becomes much more serious on the ad side and then the organic side can benefit from it too and not to mention the price just that it takes to stand this up and to get streaming up and running from a resources perspective right from all the engineers that need to know about this and Right now, I think the streaming ecosystem is so complicated and it's just so confusing. How are search and discovery teams built at the bigger tech companies? There are many different teams doing search and discovery. Frequently, they'll have an R&D team. They'll have like a practice team that will implement what the research team has done to different models. And then frequently, they separate the organic team from the ads team. Like Typically, there will be search and discovery. Like, they won't call it search and discovery for ads. They'll call it uh, ads ranking and ads targeting. Maybe it's easier to talk more about a smaller company, um, let's say like a DoorDash or, or like an Airbnb. So frequently they'll have a platforms team that's, that are building tools. There'll be a data team that's providing all of the eventing and then providing the, the, the raw material for producing both features and, and training examples. There'll be usually an ML infrastructure team for training models and hosting the models. There's frequently a research and development team that's coming up with new model architectures. Then there's frequently a data science team that is analyzing models and, and frequently provides an interface to maybe more business oriented or product management type of teams. Then there are usually one or several types of call them like middleware kind of engineering teams that are taking the raw resources from the machine learning systems and then applying them to specific applications. And those would be typically named things like ranking for such and such surface or, or, or search and such and such search retrieval, or maybe like a such and such product kind of those kind of teams. So those teams would be maybe working in Python or, or Java and applying models or training models using the infrastructure provided by other teams and using the data provided by other teams. Frequently, it's divided up in a way like this. And in your experience, how was it, like, would you all have like a, a week or a month to try and fix technical debt? And how would you go about that if, if at all, um, was that just kind of constantly happening where you would be refactoring code or was it like, would you set aside a, a specific amount of time? And then th I'm just thinking about all these teams potentially playing together and interwoven. And the one thing that's common with all of them is the data, I imagine. Mm -hmm. how, how does that play on? Like, I imagine that gives another layer of complexity and potential like uh like the famous uh google paper right like the high interest credit card debt of machine learning and so did you think about that at all were what was the strategy around it oh interesting i think you're getting at one is who who owns signals and then who can apply them so once you're consuming a signal what if that signal changes and hmm. who owns that life cycle? So frequently there needs to be versioning. I've seen attempts to manage this. It's, it's, it's hard. I think, I think one part of it is it just recognizing that it, that it is hard and that it's complicated and it frequently requires 
a little bit more relaxation on always measuring every single AB impact and more thinking of things as, as services that you consume as a black box, which is very difficult for teams to do sometimes if they're not quite meeting KPIs. If someone wants to change the signal, but that's going to mean it's going to be regressed for a few weeks or even months while they come up with the next version, like maybe changing model architecture. That can be very challenging to manage internally. And so I've seen people try to build feature stores and machine learning platforms to try and make this all uh, automated and run by the machine with, with varying levels of success. My personal opinion on this is it takes strong technical leadership from the top to manage these kind of horse trading issues and, and not just allow internal teams to forever argue with each other about horse trading and AB experimentation and, and launch reviews and keep a more unified vision of this is the direction we ultimately want to go so long as this is using more data, there's some reason, a mechanistic reason for this to be useful that even if the metrics are ambiguous or mixed, that they are, have the, the uh, confidence to continue to move forward versus forcing everything to go through such a super clean A-B experimentation and launch review for every service that everyone de depends on, that can be tremendously slow and frequently gets corrupted because eventually someone needs to get something launched and they'll just bypass that pro progress. And there's uh. <laughs> then once you have that happening, it it's pretty ugly, but I think it takes a certain level of very strong technical leadership from the top to help guide people to take some risks and, okay, is it okay if this is launched, even if it's not quite sure? Well, we have faith that this is the right sort of architecture that we want and not tie people so desperately to KPIs and AB experimentation. That, that's my, my personal opinion. I don't think this can be purely solved from a technical and infrastructure standpoint in terms of feature stores and signal management and versioning. That said, there are some best practices like when you launch a new version of your signal, you should make a new version of it and then people adapt into the new version and then you have some sort of system for, hey, we're gonna deprecate this other signal after six months or something like this and, and have the resource and budget to be able to have parallel versions of your system so that people can migrate over. Like there's some, I'd say table stakes for how teams should work together when they're consuming other signals and, and uh, working together. But that said, I don't want there to be any belief for, for, from, from me that this can be solved by technology. It is an organization leadership challenge that can be facilitated by technology. Oh man, yeah, it's music to my ears because a lot of the times we do talk about tech a lot, but I and a lot of people that come on here and most of the co-hosts, we all know that it's not always about the tech. And it's actually most of the time not about the tech. We try to keep it as much as possible about this organizational piece too, because that is, I mean, it's ML ops. We're playing, we're standing on the shoulders of DevOps and DevOps everyone who knows about DevOps, that is very much a organizational piece as much as it is, as it is a tech piece. And there is one thing that I was thinking about when it comes to promoted the tool that you've built is mm -hmm. you have this clear understanding of how these big companies do their data. And were you looking at something were you looking to build something that was going to plug into one of these bigger companies or was it something for for someone who's going zero to one and they can just have it right off the gate, right out the gate, right off the bat before yes. they need to clean everything up? Former. It's for big marketplaces. It's for social media. It's for this could run Pinterest. Dan and uh. I were Pinterest engineers. We're trying to solve the things that we wish Pinterest had done. The problems that we're solving are, what if you are a scaled marketplace? And the difference in, let's say, let's say you can make 5% more revenue 
per user. That's the difference between profitable and unprofitable at scale. It's the difference between you should continue to be in business versus eventually you will go out of business. It is a tremendous step change. And it's like every day you get better, every day you get worse. And these kind of efficiencies, five, 10% is they're huge at scale and the efficiency Uh matters tremendously. And that's what we're going after. So then knowing what you know about the organization and all of these different teams that you mapped out just a minute ago, how do you fit into that? Like, do you just plug into all the different teams? Do you say we're going to specifically talk to the ML platform team, for example? Yeah. What does that look like? Yes. We, it's kind of a, a, a naive idea, but it turned out to work accidentally. We decided to build our own data and measurement infrastructure. Because how hard could it be? Well, Dan Hill, my co-founder, is just a genius and really good at building infrastructure. And and we set up our own data infrastructure. So what we do is we provide our own streaming data infrastructure and we provide it at no additional cost. And we measure everything in your marketplace, everything in your app. We do all of our own eventing. We do all of our own... um, measurement join like we we can plug into other sources like from segment or or amplitude or whatnot but when you are generating the types of volume and quality of data that are necessary for doing very high level types of machine learning you're talking terabytes of data and this is something we've also seen is people think they're logging a lot of data and then they need to start logging annotated impressions like in a mobile device you're trying to send like I don't know, 20 attributes per impression and someone just scrolls or if you even go, and now I have like 20 impressions. Oh no, that's not going to work. So we built all of this infrastructure for measurement and joining and we provide it at no cost. And that gives us a extremely found, strong foundation to build amazing machine learning models that have a picture of here's everything that you're doing. And then regarding working with other teams or, or other machine learning teams, the style of machine learning that we have, you can stack models. You can send to us, if it's, a, if it's a user model, you can just send it in our user CMS system. If it's an item model, you can like send, you can like a clustering or whatever it is, collaborative filtering or embeddings, you upload it to our, our item CMS. And if it's a item query or user cross, like a, a relevance item relevance or user relevance model, you can attach it on the insertions that you send to us. And the way our system is built is, we're super wasteful in some sense on data infrastructure, but we've made it very efficient. And we can model on top of all the other models that you currently have. And we can also report back to you every day. Here's, here's where your models missed out. Like here are the additional features and information that we had that were able to get you more in performance. And we used your other models as signals and can combine them together. And then from a machine learning perspective, it's, oh, if you can model on top of another model, the other features that are important are explaining the residual error of, of, of what these models were. So we can interface with your existing in-house data science team where we can ingest their models and then build on top of it versus entirely replacing it. And same thing for other data signals. You can just send it all to promoted. And at the end of the day, our data infrastructure is this enormous uh, denormalize or join or in real time, collecting all of these signals and then training the models in real time to be able to find here's what the signals are. Interesting. That brings me to the next question. You're still a very small startup where you have a very limited number of people. I believe eight. I'm not entirely sure if the team size has changed recently. Um, what are the big engineering challenges that you face when working with such a small team? Um, that's a great question. Especially because you're catering to a very big space and you're working with companies that have important data challenges as well. It's not like, let's just test it. You have to sort of prove it, which is, it's, it's very ROI based business. The, the, the proving part, so here are some challenges. One is we had to strip out a tremendous number of features. We focused exclusively on proving that our models produce revenue. 
at the expense of virtually every other feature. And by the way, one of the things that got ex that de got deprioritized was metrics and A/B testing. You'll you'll hear from a variety of customers that will say, oh, hey, or a, a variety of, of vendors and say, hey, we'll do an A-B test and we'll, we'll outperform this such and such vendor or your existing system. At the level that we sell, nobody will take our metrics of do we work or not. They will run their own A-B experiment. So although we have, we fully support A-B experimentation, we have a dashboard, we have um, metrics and whatnot. What we found was no matter what you produce, if you if their team has to be able to measure that A-B experiment, they have to prove to themselves that you are outperforming their other models or any other vendors. Oh, we've been benchmarked against Algolia. We've been benchmarked against a variety of different versions of combinations of in-house models and AWS personalized and, and whatnot. So one of our challenges is your fighting against reality, it's it's just hard to build a such a complicated system that can reliably produce an increase in revenue. And keeping super focused on that, one, it allows us to improve the revenue of our customers over very strong baselines. And also according to their in-house team who has a mandate to show that one, we don't work and therefore they get our budget to go hire people, right? And, and so they are very motivated, like we have to win them over. It has to really, really work. And we have to explain how it works so that they trust us. And it feels so great when we win the trust of our customers and, and not just like the business team, but the individual data science and, and machine learning experts that we're working with. And the, the challenge of this is that it's hard to build such a system it's just a lot of work. The other challenge is we have to strip out a tremendous number of features. Another challenge is, which we're, we're going back now and adding more of. Um, hmm. Another challenge is we can only work with a few customers because it's challenging to provide that level of service for a few enterprise customers. And so for example, we can't provide today, we can't afford to provide a freemium version of our product. You can't just freemium your way to getting started. We won't do free trials because we don't have the staff to deal with it. We don't have a solutions engineering team today to be able to deal with that. Well, we will one day. Well, one day it will be go, go going to be free trials. But today we 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 have uh, you pay up front. Yeah, like how much white gloving needs to actually happen because of all this complexity. Well, in theory, none. In theory, here's all the open source SDKs. Install it the way that we ask, and it just runs, in theory. In practice, these are large engineering teams that are prioritizing for a variety of different reasons. And if something is not clear or they have something that comes up, you always integration with some hypothetical other platform that might be better, it's always like a medium priority task. <laughs> Medium priority tasks don't ever get done. They get starved. Yeah. It's really something important to get done. And, and so in practice, having some service level to help get integrated, it's not because people can't do it or they don't want to. It's more like from a practical standpoint, that's how real engineering organizations are actually run. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. The, the other side of it is that helps us build a fantastic product, right? We have to eat our own dog food. It better be amazing. You, we have a much tighter feedback loop if, if we're there in the trenches helping, making sure everything works. And it turns out there's all sorts of like, oh, you know, the mobile device is this way, but actually the web is this other way. And they're, they're not compatible, <sighs> but you know, like you, you find out all of these weird things and you have to help them work through it. Whereas again, if it's this medium priority task, it will, People go, oh, I don't know what to do. I'll just wait until someone tells me what to do. And then it never gets done yeah. so we can help move that forward. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of rolls into the next question, which is how you, I think I read you're hiring for a staff machining, machine learning engineer. And yeah. I would imagine that is for this type of thing. I, 
I feel like if I understood correctly, you are allowing the companies, the enterprise companies to also bring their models and plug it in to promote it. Is that correct? Yes. That, that's part and of, so then, from, yeah, from big tech perspective, that's how these models are frequently built. As you frequently, we were talking about signal management. These are frequently uh -huh. literally other models owned by other teams and there exist technologies to aggregate them all together and have like a final model that does the, the ranking. We're using that type of technology. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, but I, uh, I don't know if I explained myself correctly on that, but so it's like the, when you plug into, uh, Pinterest or whoever, Pinterest can say, okay, now we have these models from this side of the company. We want to tr start running them on promoted. That's what it is? No, they would send or us the model execution results. So you would send us the score for users or for items or computed on the insertion and send them to us on our metric system. We won't actually host a model and execute it on our side. You just send us, okay. here's, our, here's what the model outputs are. What they can do is if they have a Jupyter notebook and they can execute it and then send us the evaluation results and load it to our item content management system API or our user content management API, or if this model is appropriately designed, they can execute it in real time on a request with low enough latencies. So like a relevance model, like does this item match this, match this query? And they have some sort of score or, or frequently this will be in an existing search retrieval system where they have like a search quality score. You can send that to us and then we can model on top of it. And the way our system works is every, we're, we're constantly reselecting features and modeling on top of all of the signals we have available. And we'll tell you, hey, here's how important the signal you sent to us was in the final result. And we can also like do a holdout if you want to, to see here's how much it improved by including it or not, for example. Nice. I see. Now we're getting to the end of time and I've got one last question for you, which I think everyone is really interested in because you mentioned real time and batch, and that is a hot topic that comes up quite a bit in the MLOps community. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. in your eyes, what are the biggest gotchas or some of the biggest snags when you're doing streaming and you're doing real time? Yes. Oh, a lack of commitment. And the second is having our streaming system so slow that it may as well be batched. <laughs> I'd say I'd say those two. Um, the, the commitment part is it's really difficult to build streaming. It's like you usually have a, a batch system first and it works pretty well. And then you try doing the streaming system and not only is it a huge load and all this new infrastructure and now you have the like ML ops team has to watch it or data ops team has to watch it. But maybe you run an A-B test and it wasn't that impactful or something like this. And, and this comes into the lack of commitment, which is, oh, well, well, we'll try it. But you didn't design your product or your strategy around having real-time availability. It was, hey, you have an existing product and system designed around batch, like this sort of, hey, it takes a while for signals to become available. And then you sort of, you just replace that directly with streaming. And, and then it's like, oh, well, we'll do an A-B test and we'll be data-driven about this. This is not commitment. This is, this requires no management or leadership whatsoever, really, except for resource procurement and, and product project management. Leadership is like TikTok, like, oh, it is going to be reactive to what you are doing right now. And this product wouldn't work at all, fundamentally, it would be a fundamentally different product, like the difference between Facebook newsfeed from 10 years ago and TikTok today. They, they're reacting in real time to what you're doing. Or, or like from an ad system, it's, hey, we have, um, we, we started with this really ad hoc, you know, bid your click and everything is kind of, you get a report every day and now we're going to put on this real time system and somehow that's going to make it better. Well, maybe a little bit, but that's different from, oh, we have this real-time pacing system that is streaming results and it's, it's going to dynamically adjust your internal systems to get an efficiency, like how Facebook has built their discount pacer system, for example. So the commitment piece is 
did you design your company and product strategy around streaming? Or is it just like an upgrade of a subcomponent that you could take or leave depending on uh, a, a, an AB experimentation? And the latter, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just don't expect to become TikTok because you replaced a Hive job with a Flink job and you know some backend system. Like, let, let's say you're, you're joining events. Okay, how long are you waiting for your event? Three hours? Oh, well now your signal is gonna be delayed three hours. So what was the point of doing streaming in the first place? If it was like some sort of user recommendation system, is someone still on your site anymore after three hours? No, it, it or, or like, hey, it just a, it takes a really long time for this to go through your whole big long pipeline to be able to get the response through whatever is applying that, that signal to, or to whatever is consuming that signal. Well, you may as well do batch because it took too long. Or, or it's always down and it's always like you have to like do a backfill and you always have to rerun it. Well, you need to figure out what the latencies are for your product and you have to meet those latencies. If you don't have any idea and it's just, well, let's just make it faster and hope it's better somehow, then you're more of the former case of, hey, we replaced a batch with a streaming and somehow that's gonna make it better. It might but it's a tremendous investment in complexity and infrastructure costs. And it might be a very modest improvement of KPI metrics, if, if any, versus, hey, I want a real-time recommender system. Oh, that means it needs to react in like three seconds. Okay, do you have the full signal piped all the way through the system to whatever is consuming it in three seconds? If not, then why are you doing streaming at all? Why don't you just do batch because it's too late. But our biggest need, by the way, yes, we have a, a job rec for, uh, for for machine learning. We have three more around data infrastructure and streaming. So if you want to build real data streaming services that get used for real value, come work at Promoted. If you know Flink, there we go. come work for us. We love, love Flink engineers. At the end of the day, and this is what Promoted is about, you have one marketplace. Profits you pull from your marketplace have to come from somewhere have to just there's one marketplace you have one mobile screen you need to optimize the entire marketplace altogether and the only way you can do that is be super honest about where your value is coming from so that you can train honest models that can deliver that value if you don't have that sort of honesty then your machine learning models will do what you tell them to do if you say hey maximize this ridiculous nonsense story i've created for pulling forward budgets this quarter from my brand advertisers. Your models will happily go do that. And that sort of tech debt is different than the sort of tech debt of what I think people frequently think of as, hey, where are my signals and data infrastructure? It's more like an organizational trust debt. Those kind of compromises compounding over time end up with a lousy system. And it will still deliver search and feed results and ads, and they will charge some amount of money and people will use it, but it, it just won't ever work really well. I appreciate this so much, man. Andrew, we, uh, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I, I think this has been awesome. You blew my mind a little bit. It took me a minute to really wrap my head around what exactly you were doing and why. And now that I see the motivation behind it and what you are are dealing with and how you are impacting companies and specifically these marketplaces as you're talking about Whew. yeah it's enticing congratulations on on what you're building and i hope to see this popping up all over the place soon enough if anybody out there is interested in doing stuff with streaming hit up Andrew. I, I'm guessing on LinkedIn is the best place to talk with you. Otherwise, uh, is there somewhere else, else right? we can leave your Link. yeah LinkedIn in yeah. the description a below. A uh, a yeah, LinkedIn, a at promoted.ai. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Right on. There we go.